Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is our fourth and final class on religion. We will have one more class that's Egypt-related, but it'll be on its own kind of topic. Uh, so what we'll um, talk about next month is the Amarna heresy, which is uh, there was a pharaoh in Egypt who decided that we all should be monotheists. And that there's only one God we should worship, and he tried to establish the worship of a single God, and it's really the first recorded instance of of widespread religious monotheism. It's fascinating for its implications for Christianity and all sorts of other things. And so these four lectures have been on traditional relig Egyptian religion, and then we'll talk about the Amarna its own, in its own little um, pocket next month. And then we'll be completely done with Egypt. So we're done with mainline Egypt religion, and next month we'll have one more on kind of a weird outlier thing that happened and then we'll be done with Egypt completely, and we can move on to Mesopotamia or wherever you guys may actually need to pass around a, a uh, alter that. And so what we're going to do in the future is Friday work. The day off that I chore, what ends up happening is I prep the, the week before and then I get off work and come straight here and I don't look at my notes. And those classes don't go as well. It's a little bit more confusion on the schedule. Uh, the result will be I think you get better classes. So I'm going to do something a little different. Um, and when we're done here, uh, my schedule and, and the calendar, and we'll figure out it'll be for next week. But we'll do that if you get going. I have a 40 something slides. We may not be able to go through all 140, but I want to. And I want to, I feel like <clears throat> the topics are fairly repetitive. In other words, what I'm saying today is going to be similar to what I said last month. But they really are each time in a different context. And so, as I do things you already know in a new set, that these concepts are connected. Because what we did is, um, let's see if I can get this. Where was this one? This class, we talked about Egypt. Writing earliest, you know, religious texts, the earliest large religious, earliest large text, the religious corpus known to man. We talked about translating Egyptian, the Rosetta Stone, and then that you use. And when we said that the Egyptian theory is this set up. The symbol is to establish eternal life and to establish. The goal here is to establish ma'at, truth, justice, and the Egyptian stability in the face of isfit, which is chaos. So the problem. In, in class two, mythology, and we talked about the, the, and this wasn't funerary stuff yet, but it was talking about what the Egyptians believed about the soul, right? You've got a soul, hidden soul has different body, different parts, right? There's the ba and the ka, and I don't know where that's coming from, don't want you. Uh, now my thing is working. So there's the Ba, the Ka, there's the Ak, which is the glorified body, there's the Ka, which is the double, there's um, an, a heaven, and then there's mummification as a way to get there. There's the weighing of the heart, etc. So that was class two. In class three, we did funerary tradition. So theology told you what the soul was made of and what they believed about heaven. The funerary texts were about how to get there. 
So we did the text and the architecture. So for example, they built pyramids to get there. We went through how they mummified bodies. We talked about you know, the, the, the mortuary temples over here, and we talked about the Valley of the Kings, and there's a great book with pictures of the Valley of the Kings floating around. Um, make sure you get a chance to look through it. Um, and then we talked about the texts and the Book of the Dead and, and the stories. So, for example, there's a ritual where they open the mouth of the mummy, where meaning they touch the different parts of the mummy, and they say, we touch your eyes that you can see and your mouth that you can speak. And then they bring the, the dead mummy to life. So the mummy is an idol. So this is, again, connected to the first class. The first class said, the word is the deed. The symbol is the thing. Well, if the mummy is the symbol of the person, then, then he contains in some way the essence of the person. And the magic spell brings him to life because the word that says he can speak lets him speak in a spiritual sense and somehow he gains life in another world of some sort. Um, <clears throat> you've also got spells for how his soul goes up to heaven because he's got to wake up the ferryman who is asleep. And then he's got to pass the dangers because the, the sky is blue because it's made out of water. And as he sails across the sky, there are nets in the way. And we talked about how he has to know all these secret names. Remember, there are names and things he has to know in order to make sure that he can pass the net. So the secret knowledge lets him pass the net and gain fellowship with the gods, enter the presence of the gods, prove that he is a god so that he can dwell with the gods forever in their home as one of them, gaining fellowship with them. So... To gain fellowship with them, he has to enter their fraternity. So there's initiation rituals. And we talked about the connection between this and this. Very temple where the body of the Pharaoh is protected. People come to worship the Pharaoh. A cult is where people go to worship the gods. It's not worshiping the Pharaoh. Like again, today's class is a little repetitive. But to me, the repetition is what they believe believe the gods worked in the worship of the gods. And then we already talked about so we talked about myths in an earlier class and today it's written in stone and we'll see rich there should be a little bit of repetition but that, that part of what makes um, <clears throat> this book because it's great and it just says everything I'm really going to say. The problem with this book is it's, it's a scholarly book that's kind of not a popular science or popular architecture or, or, or history book. It's a, it's a scholastic book. And as a scholastic book, the essential, what that essentially means is it's old, it's out of print, and uh, even when it was in print, they only printed five. So, uh, you know, you end up paying $500 or something ridiculous. So you probably won't find this, but if you ever get a chance, if you find it at a library or if you can get it through interlibrary loan, A Guide to Religious Ritual at Abydos by David Rosali. And that says, no, this is not the actual book cover, but that's the cover on the Amazon, you know, when Amazon tries to sell it to you for 50 bucks or 60 bucks or whatever it was. It's insanely expensive, but, but you can actually get it on Amazon, but get it through an interlibrary loan, you know, whatever it takes. This is the other one. Um, you'll see me quote from this.
Um, it's this one. You can probably get it on Amazon um, for 25 bucks or something. It's The Complete Temples of Ancient Egypt. It's published by Thames and Hudson by Richard Wilkinson, and it's not a bad book. Um, so those are, those are my book suggestions if you want to go learn about Egypt. Like I said, I gave book suggestions last a uh, few classes ago, but that was on Egyptian history and Egyptian religion, and these are, this is the, the book to, to go to for cultic temple practices. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, God's house. We'll talk about how the temple served as God's house. We'll talk about how the temple represented the creation, and then we'll talk about how the temple presented a journey that the deceased, or that the priest, sorry, could take to heaven. So the rituals at the temple presented a journey to heaven. And to do that, we're actually going to read from the temple liturgy at Karnak. The only translation I could find of it is in French. So you're going to read my translation, which isn't very good because I don't do Egyptian very well. But whatever, I did it um, when I was actually back at BYU taking an Egyptian class. I couldn't do it now um, at all, but I have some of my old class notes. So you're going to you're going to be stuck with my attempt to read the text at you from, from my notes from years ago. Um, and, and that'll be this journey to the heavens, path of deceased. We'll actually go through the ritual. And then in conclusions, I'll try to put everything we've done together and talk about thing melted. Okay. This new no we can we can make added mud break and they were very proud of that technology so proud that you know we get this tower of babel story um, of course, that's when the Mesopotamians get mud baked bricks, but the Egyptians used them too. And so when we build later temples in stone, they will imitate the forms of these earlier buildings that were made out of reeds and mud baked bricks. So let's start with the, mud, the reeds and talk about how this works. The temple is God's house. So a primitive king or chief always had a better house than the common people. So the god, who's superior to the king, had to have a better house than the king. So the original temple was just a fine hut. It was a better hut than those used by the human beings around it. So you, you take a hut, you make a really nice one, and that's the temple. So you've got, a, you've got a, a village full of huts, and you make one really nice one, and that's the earliest temple made out of reeds. So one day, uh, I was visiting Egypt, and I was floating down the Nile in a nice little boat. And I looked off to the side and I saw this thing. And unfortunately, it was getting dark. And I snapped this picture as quickly as I could. And this was years and years ago. So I had an old film camera with fairly low resolution. And, and this is unfortunately the picture you get. But I, uh, if I kind of zoom in on it and play with the contrast, uh, this is what you see. Now, I was absolutely shocked that people were living in this level of poverty. Um, my first thought was, oh my gosh, that's it. That's that early reed hut. Here we have people, and if you actually look at what, we, what, what it's made of, see this bundle of reeds? What they've done is they've taken a huge bunch of reeds from the Nile, bundled them together into a clump, and tied them together to make a pillar. And that creates vertical support. And you can hold up the structure that way. Uh, and people were actually living in this thing. Yeah, Chuck. Papyrus is a, one specific reed. They make these out of a lot of different kinds of reeds that grow, grow along the Nile. Papyrus is a very handy reed because it's got these leaves that you can strip off and make paper out of. And that's how the Egyptians invented paper. But papyrus is one of the things they made these out of, yes. 
I believe you can make a boat, but I don't know. The question was, can you make a boat out of papyrus? I don't honestly know. But what, what I was so excited about was, was the, the way the structure is created out of these bundles of reeds tied together. So I had this mix of horror and, and, and uh, kind of deja vu awe. Because I've seen this before. Because once the Egyptians, uh, one, the Egyptians are incredibly, well, because, of course, because they want to establish Ma'at, which is this true justice in the Egyptian way, and because Ma'at was originally from the earliest time established by the gods when the world was created in mythical time, the Egyptians are conservative. They never throw anything away. So one way to think of them is they're like a group of people who want eternal life, and it's just tantalizingly out of reach. It's in a chest. And they know that the chest is locked because they keep dying. And they keep trying to open the chest, and it just won't open. So they, they start looking for keys to the chest. And they don't know which key opens the chest, so they keep them all. And so everything that they add to the keys, but they never get rid of them. They just hold on to them. They keep them all. And that's probably the best way to describe the Egyptians. So once you start making temples that look like this, because that's how they made their earliest houses, they don't stop looking like that. And so there it was, the origin of the Egyptian temple tradition, kind of sitting on the edge of the Nile with a, with a family living in it. Um, and and I said, this, was, this was one of those great moments that I, I could have gotten a better picture of it. But there's the picture of uh, intent for visits to the countryside from the tomb of Warini. So this is not a temple. This is a portable tent. This is a rich guy who's made this kind of portable tent out of these reeds that attach at the top with a curved wooden beam at the top of that. And then he's get the, he gets these rug things that he, he hangs down the sides. Um, the simplest shelter that we know in Egypt is a reed hut with a projecting roof to shade the entrance. This is the simplest shrine. The next step was to make the hut wider, put a row of reed columns to carry the front shade. The portico thus begins. The house models must always have a courtyard in front of the portico, and the temples always had a similar court. Within the court stood the emblems of the god on a pole, and on either side of the door of the court stood poles with flags. These grew into the row of flagstaffs in front of the pylon. Besides these fixed features, there were many chambers for stores, priests arranged on various plants. Now, that's a lot of text describing it. Let me show you what that means in pictures. <clears throat> this is the oldest temple I know of. In Compolis. Um, and this is a group of people at Temple. You notice they've, they've laid out a grid to, to figure out what they can find in different places. And then they've got these big holes. Those holes are actually posts because this is the reconstruction of what they're excavating or an artist's drawing of what it would have looked like. You notice at the top, and on it sits a deity. Now, if you remember the creation myth, do you remember when I told you the creation myth? A mound rose out of the water, and a falcon went and pulled up a, a reed out of the flotsam and jetsam and planted the reed on the upright in the, on the mound, lighted upon it, and that became the standard, and around him grew the temple. So there's our flagpole. Here's these, these other flags uh, holding up the porch, and, uh, and then the flags will become important in a bit, with other small buildings out front, uh, for administrative purposes, and then you go back here, and here's where the deity would have lived. This is just a hut like normal people lived in, only bigger and more impressive with some poles and flags added. This is a late temple. You see these um, holes here in the, in the wall? Now, what you've got here is a scene of the pharaoh smiting his enemies. Actually, this is the best place to see it. You see the pharaoh smiting his enemies. This thing is so massive, I had to take two pictures and then stitch them together. I didn't do a great job. You can see the, the stitch. Um, but, but you see, there's the pharaoh smiting his... And back then, we didn't have the panorama. Of, you know, this is film camera. Anyway, there's the pharaoh smiting his enemies. Here's Ra protecting the entrance. So this is a guarded place. And then in front, you have these those holes for... Well, those are where they put the flag. So if we go back, you see the four flags, and now you see the four holes. So that was the earliest temple from prehistory. This is a, you know, Middle Kingdom, I believe, up here, but this is a late uh, 
thing down here. And you notice again the, the spots for the flags. Now the flags have rotted away because they were made out of wood, et cetera. But the point is continuity, right? Uh, those flags were important, so they kept them. And they never went away. In fact, they're, they're nice enough to draw pictures of a temple on a relief wall. So now we can see what it would have looked like when the flags were actually there. And there, of course, there are nice flags waving in the breeze um, set upon the pylons. Uh, and then we get this. This is the hieroglyph. I always want to tie this back to the writing. So we had a class on writing, but the writing keeps coming up. This is the Egyptian hieroglyph for, for uh, Necher. It's the word for God. Um, and it is a flag. Of course, the earliest Egyptologists didn't know what it was. They, they, there was an argument for a while about whether this is an axe or a flag. It's a flag. And it comes from those flags that mark the sacred spot. The temple sat on these sacred spots, and so they would mark them with flags, and so the flag became even the, the hieroglyph for, for God. So that's how you write God, and, it, and that's how you mark a divine space where the gods are worshipped where they live. So it says, the first known evidence of temple building in stone occurs in Dynasty 3, but the stonemasons still set out to imitate the designs and patterns which for centuries they had employed in the reed and brick structures. So remember, you make them out of reed, you can make them out of brick, and now they can make them out of stone. In Dynasty 3, they start doing that. Why do you think they moved to stone? It lasts longer. So if you're an Egyptian and you're trying to establish permanence, you can do it in two ways. You can attach yourself to one of the eternal cycles. We had a name for that a couple classes ago, Nehet. That's eternity through cycle, cyclical return. This is the sun rising and setting. So you'll point your temple maybe at the sun so that the sun rises between the pylons on the solstice. You can also try to make something solid, stable, and lasting. Rock, stone, that's jet. Time and all eternity, or Nehet jet. So nehets, the cycles, jets, the stability. So when you move from the reeds to stone, you're trying to, to make permanent something that was before impermanent, but you're going to carve it to look exactly like it used to look because you're an Egyptian, and that's what you do. So here is Saqqara. Now, we've seen Saqqara before. Well, I talked about Saqqara in terms of um, its funerary temple, right? This is the temple that Imhotep built for Djoser, and it's when he took a bunch of mastabas and stacked them on top of each other. And this is a temple. But out front, they have a courtyard. Purpose is for the Heb Set Festival, which is a, a festival in which the pharaoh would um, renew his right to reign. So this is a, a, a ritual the pharaoh performed to cement his right to rule over Egypt and to rejuvenate himself as the god king on earth who can... And what he would do is there's a little, you know... Um, model of, of the land that he controls here, and he would stride around the court and, and circulate his land, and that means he goes around it, and so he claims it is his, and, and they do all these other rituals for him, etc. So there's a lot of rituals, and we could spend a whole class on headset. I'm not going to do that. Too, so. um, and out here are uh, a bunch of shrines for, it says, it calls them shrines for provincial images. I'm not sure how that worked with the ritual. I think maybe, you know, they brought the, the statue, the idols from local deities up to Saqqara for, or to, for the ritual when he, would, when he would perform his ritual. So there's a couple things we want to look at. We want to look at these shrines because we want to look at what they looked like. So now we, now we care about something slightly different than last time. Last time we visited this, we cared about the pyramid because we were talking about how we buried, buried pharaohs. Now we're talking about rituals where we worship the gods, and here we got a bunch of shrines for deities. And we care about what these look like now. And we also care about this. You see this palace facade. The way it's drawn will be important here in just a second. The way it looks and has these crenellations. Yeah. I don't, I can't remember if Hebset is an annual festival or if it's like one of those 30 year, I think it's a 30 year sort of thing. I, like I said, I, I didn't prep that. I need to go look that up though because... I used to know. I'm pretty sure it's like a 30-year thing. Um, okay, so let's look at a drawing of one of these. You see this here? That's a bundle of reeds. So that's exactly what we saw on that little hut on the side of the Nile, but now it's carved out of stone. 
So let me show you a picture. Here are, the, here are those little huts. You see that bowed top? That's what we saw in that guy's little portable tent. That, high, that picture I showed you before, it wasn't a temple. He was just carrying a portable tent around. He would set up tent. Setting up tents and having them be portable shrines should sound familiar to anyone who's familiar with Israelite theology too. This is the tabernacle of Moses. So I hope that this stuff isn't just interesting for an Egyptian perspective. It should be interesting because of the connections it has with, with Judaism and therefore with Christianity. Okay, so let's um, try to show you what, what's going on. This is a reed hut. You can make really fancy reed huts. I mean, this is a fancy. See how it's made with the, um, the, the pillars made out of bundles, and then you've got these bundles and then this arched roof. And then let's go and put them next to each other. And you see what they've done, right? They've taken an actual architectural um, design out of reeds and carved it out of stone. And here's some more, some more pictures from, from Saqqara. This one is a late Roman pyramid, uh, uh, temple. But again, I want you to see the, the similarity. You see this design here for the entryway? And you see these pictures here uh, for how they do the tops. Let's go um, back. Third dynasty. And this is thousands of years later in Egypt, or in, in uh, Roman times. And you'll notice they're doing the same thing. And they've even got this. You see that, that when they're, these almost look like Greek pillars by this point, right? But you see the, the flowers on them. They're still trying to carve reed bundles in only now in stone okay and, and really nice because you can even see right here the strings those are strings tied around the bundle and you can even see the knot and they've carved all the details including the little knot holding the reed bundles together so now the reed bundles have become these pillars in the temple and these are from wildly different times and places um, all showing kind of some of the same ideas. So, God's house. This is a, an early, I believe, first dynasty pharaoh um, inscription. And here is a picture of the temple, including a porch with a little shade, and then the, the curved top, et cetera, next to it. So that's our hieroglyph in old Egyptian, really old Egyptian, for a temple. So what this depicts is the, the pharaoh... And you've got a picture of the temple next to it. So <clears throat> if we think about this, we've got houses made out of mud brick and, and reed mats. The reed mats are similar to the portable shrines. The portable shrines can be hieroglyph for shrine. So there's a hieroglyph for shrine right here. And they can be carved out of stone. The best first example is in the step pyramid architecture, and it goes all the way down to late temples and temple exteriors in Rome. And I just picked up, that was an early hieroglyph for, for temple. I picked up a smattering. What I did is I, I got Gardner. Gardner Gardner is the, he was the guy who compiled the sign list. If you remember the first class, we talked about the, the guy who compiled all the different hieroglyphs and made the sign list. The sign list, and I, and I took a bunch of the ones that he had written there for, for temple. And I spattered them across my screen. So these are just, a, uh, you can see how it, how it is, how it has nearly infinite variation, but maintains a certain standard similarity and idea. The, this one in the upper right is really interesting to me because um, that shape there is something that shows up. I still don't know quite what they're trying to draw there, but that cutout in the bottom square thing shows up on, on pictures of thrones. So when you see... Um, Osiris sitting on a throne, um, that, that shape will be there, carved into the throne. Um, it's also there on Isis. Um, in fact, Isis's name, and sometimes you'll see that exact hieroglyph uh, drawn above her head to depict her name. Um, as far as I can tell, that has something to do with the throne. And so the fact that they put it on a temple all indicates to me that they're thinking of the temple as God's throne. And now that that's my own kind of spin on this, but... But the temple is a house for God, but God is kind of a king. He's the king. He's a, 
the earthly king is a represent, representative of the God, but the God is kind of the king of heaven. And so temples to gods are places where you put God's throne. So they're not just houses, they're palaces for kings, heavenly kings. Again, this is the sort of thing that shows up in Israel as well. All right, so now let's do mud brick houses for a minute because those look a little different. The basic form of the shrine is in, in mud brick, at least is a niche. A niche in a rock that served by modest brick shelters was kept throughout the old kingdom and apparently on until the time of the reunification of Egypt in the 11th dynasty at the beginning of the middle kingdom, a period of six centuries. This is what that looks like. And one of the reasons you see a lot of this when you start looking at mud brick and even stone stat, uh, works, you see a lot of these kind of knee-high uh, ruins. Have you ever been to an ancient site? And, and you can see them, in fact, if you go to, um, to Bandelier, right? You always get this kind of knee-high uh, remnant of rocks. Well, one of the reasons for that, especially in, in Israel and Egypt, is, you know, when you make stuff out of mud brick and stone, it's, it's heavy. You don't, you don't carry the thing away. I mean, it's, you just don't carry these away. You carry them away when you make something else out of them sometimes. But it's big and it's heavy. So when a house is, gets old and, is, and you need to make a new one, you knock the thing over. And when you knock a house over made out of, you know, mud brick, it breaks off and everything kind of falls over, and it leaves this kind of knee-high length of stuff. But then the stuff that falls over backfills the thing. You could, you know, take a bulldozer in modern times and scrape it all out and get back down to the bedrock. But if you're in the ancient times, that's a lot of work. Leave the stuff backfilled. So you have these knee-high remnants of the original structure backfilled with the detritus from when they knocked the thing over, and then they build something else on top of it. And so this is a bonanza for archaeologists because you can go through the layers and find these, you know, knee-high ruins at each layer, and you've got a floor plan. Unfortunately, you don't have the, the ceiling and the, and the walls, but you've got a floor plan because you've got these little knee-high um, sections. And this is what we see here. So we've got these knee-high sections going all the way around, and then we've got this funny thing in the middle. And it's not a knocked-over... Uh, section. It's got a smooth top. This was actually its height originally. So what is this? And then there's a wall right here going between these two natural rocks. So this was a natural shrine. You can see when in the really ancient times they'd find something that was almost a shrine by itself and then they would build these things in front of it out of mud brick. And there was a little niche in the back. Temple. So what's going on in this temple? Well, First, what's with that little square thing in the middle? Um, when we excavate, we sometimes find neat little things that, like this. See these, these little um, depictions of gods sitting on shrines on top of little stone blocks covered in some sort of, a, of an oval shape covering, and that's um, a reed, we believe, mat. So what you do is you put this reed mat on top of it. I think I have, may have. Where the, in the world is my mouse? Here it is. Let's see if I can get my notes to come up. I don't know why they went away. Here we go. So er, this is an early tent shrine. Uh, reconstruction of a tent shrine from the revealed image of God based on the brick dais in the Old Kingdom Temple at Elephantine. And then we have these additional instances of the same thing that we've dug up from all over the place. So, the excavation of the German Archaeologist Institute of Elephantine revealed the plan of the early dynastic shrine beneath the later 18th dynasty temple of the goddess Satet. Um, picture from Kemp Shaw. All right, so up here, we have the old temple here. They knocked that down and built this new temple here on top of it. And you can see the old footings here, 
um, bed of sand that they poured over it. And then the new temple built here on top of this. And, they, and then they built a shaft going down. It's almost like the old Holy of Holies was, so, was sacred and had to be preserved. So they've got a shaft, you know, to, to where you can throw offerings maybe down to the old place. And they built this new temple on top of it. Let me tell you what they're talking about with the revealed and the, the hidden. Here's that square here. That's where this sits. And there we had this statue. The here, there's a relic hidden trying to invent something sacred. You're faced with, with two problems simultaneously, but they are in conflict with each other. The first is people, because you want the people to, so you have to. Get special. The more available it is, the less special it is. Now that's not part of the world's reality, but it is part of human nature, unfortunately. And so when we get something often, it becomes commonplace. We impressive it is. So somehow you have to make it special, and that means exclusive. And so open for everybody. And it's interesting to watch all sorts of organizations struggle with this. You, you just makes everything open to everybody. And to some extent that loses some of its specialness. The, um, the Orthodox Church, uh, an old, a Greek Orthodox Church, if it's a really conservative version of it at least, they will do the entire mass behind a curtain so that you can't see it. It's bred into the flesh of Christ. It's so sacred that it has to be hidden behind the, behind the screen. And so when you do that, it has the downside of people don't get to participate. More, they have an endowment ritual that is so sacred that they want to make it sacred, but they want everyone to participate. Because that's how you, we save souls, actually. That's an, that's an exalting ordinance that they want everyone to have. In sacred, so they have to exclude those who aren't worthy or, and they won't talk about it in the open. And that's an attempt to balance the sacred and the revealed. Well, one of the ways the Egyptians like to do that is they just make two. And one is used on special occasions. One is sometimes the people can see. They'll take one out of the people, but there's another sacred, and only the high priests get to see. Probably more finely built, and, and there's a way to, they're trying to be issues. And so we believe that there was one uh, sanctuary for the deity here, and then a sanctuary out here for a, a, a rougher, cruder statue that everyone could participate in their rituals with. This is one way of balancing the revealed and the hidden. Now, this concept here uh, of the, the shrine that, that goes here evolves over time. As it is recognized, the Mesopotamians did it this way. This throne, this is, they, it acquires poles, tent poles. We'll see this in later temples is carried out during the festivals. So this is the revealed image, right? It's the revealed image that gets carried out during the festivals on its temple, etc. And they'll parade this thing around. Only even then, they'll put the deity inside or carton inside the box. They'll carry the box that's in out in front of everybody. When it's not being used, it'll be sit on, a, this sits on a little pedestal dais that looks just like that little pedestal we had in the previous temple. So this is an evolution from one to the other. And of course, this is the Ark of the Covenant from Israel. And you'll notice some similarities, including the, the poles and the angels. These are the, the cherubim, right? And so this is an evolution from one to the other that we can see that the, this is not something that exists at the earliest times. 
Apologetics that is used sometimes for the similarities between Christianity and pagan religions is the pagan religion is preserving some original teaching that was taught to Adam that, that then Christianity restores the true. That's not... Much it evolve from earlier antecedents and the Israelite version matches the late evolved version, not the early um, truth that was lost version. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was. <laughs> Area 51, we now know, right? Whole watched Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. When we do the Israelite Temple, we probably should watch uh, Raiders just for fun. But um, in any event, so now that having been said, um, I think there is a curtain of Christianity could be leveled at any religion you want, and that criticism is uh, because Christianity is similar to pagan traditions, it can't be a revealed religion. Now, uh, what I've said here, I want to be very careful, is that one apologist that, that the, the Ark was an original thing, you know, right, and God is restoring it, but it really goes back to Adam. That apologetic doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense because the Ark and the Israel borrows the late version. But um, if you wanted that, that the Ark teaches, which is it's a throne, You've left the idol off of it. The first reason is because they believe their God actually existed. And would come down. They didn't need a statue because their God was actually come down. Things they used to to part of their religion. The other reason is because in Israelite religion, man, and I need to be careful. How I say this because people don't always like this, but it's in the text. Man is in the image of God. The same word for idol. Idols are substitutes. The way the Egyptians use an idol is the idol is a substitute for God. The God isn't there, so I wash, clothe, anoint, feed. The substitute, the idol. In Jewish religion, man is the image of God. If you want to serve God, you serve the substitute for God, which is mankind himself. So in other words, if you want to serve God, go serve your neighbor. And so Jesus says, you know, when you're in temple service, there's a connection here. When you're in the service of your fellow beings, you're only in the service of your God. So I think Jesus said that um, uh, if you love me, feed my sheep. I think from the Book of Mormon. Um, I'm trying to remember the one from Matthew. But if you love me, feed my sheep. But he's got another one where he says, um, he who doeth unto the least of these, my brother, and hath done it unto me. That's the one I was looking for. Man, and wash God as you wash your neighbor. The way you feed God is you feed your neighbor. And that's just how the Egyptians would do it. Only they would feed the statue in God because it was the image of God. Well, in Israel religion, you feed your neighbor instead. And that's how you feed God. So, so, of God, who is king of heaven, but who has no idol because we are the engine feed, and because he would have to teach that concept. So let's say for just a minute that, that the Exodus happened, it's historical, it's exactly like you say you're a biblical fundamentalist, it all happened just like the Bible says. You're God for just a minute, play the role. God comes down and he says, Gee, I want to teach these people who just came out of Egypt this concept about who I am, that I'm king of heaven and that they should wash each other and that I can actually appear to them and talk to them and they shouldn't watch, worship an idol. How should I do that? Well, gee, why don't I have them make it, right? So I, um, I'm, I'm, my point isn't that you should all go out and, and be biblical fundamentalists. My point is, I tend to like good arguments. And the argument against Christianity based on its similarity to past religious traditions doesn't make much sense. 
Neither does the apologetic that it's a restoration of the original teaching. That doesn't make much sense either. But the idea that it is a way of teaching a concept, if other making it up, this is the way you make it up because this is the this he does it. It doesn't matter. What is exciting to me and what I try to focus on in my classes is. Unless you know the history of the symbol, you don't know what they were trying. Whoever's trying to say it, Moses, God, or some other guy years later, whoever's making this up, you don't know what, you don't know the context of the things that came around it. Because symbolism language. So, so I've already talked about this when we talked about hieroglyphics, but I say the word black cat and a picture of a cat appears in my mind, I say black cat. You hear those words and the picture of a black cat appears in your mind. That's symbolism. And symbolism requires a dictionary and it requires a shared understanding that comes from the culture around you. So whatever your beliefs are about, about the origins of Christianity and the existence or unexistence of God, what hopefully this class is the ability to look at this symbol and say, I don't know who's saying it, but whoever's saying it, this is what he's saying. Because I know where this idea comes from, and I know what it would have meant to the people back then. So that, that's what I, I hope this is for. All right. So the first thing we get from the mud bit, this is the little later architect, palace facades, is of a tomb. Let me see if I've got my notes about which one. Palace facade style mud brick tombs were excavated in Jacques de Morgan in the century, including this one attributed to Queen Nathan Hoth uh, of the first dynasty. 3,000. The rectangles in the center of the planet were incorporated in this superstructure at the ground level. In here we have burial chambers, and around it we have this mud brick wall that has this pattern. These crenellations structures often have these crenellations. I'm not sure if it's a the technique work or if it's just a nice way to decorate if you're building in this medium. Once we get to again Saqqara, we're building in stone for the first time, but that pattern is identical to the earlier pattern from the mud bricks except they put a door here and they incorporated the door into the shape and the design. And so these are false, false doors. I showed you the false doors before when we did uh, Egyptian funerary traditions. Do you remember what they were for? You put these doors, you carve them into stone, and then this was a place where, you know, the, the, the soul could come in and out of heaven, so he, the soul could visit his shrine. So it's a door to heaven that, that the deceased could come down through this door where the people are worshiping the deceased and they can go back up through the door up into heaven. Raise to heaven. Uh, and you'll notice the, the patterns from these palace facades. And then it shows up, there's a couple copy, different versions of it. And then it shows up here at the bottom of these later um, Roman period texts. That there is the palace facade. Um, and if we want to try to interpret it, this is water with a crocodile in it. Ceased being embalmed by um, uh, Anubis. So this, this is Anubis floating over his head, the four sons of Horus here, and the crocodile here, water. And this is the, the water. You notice the sky is made out of water. So these are the pillars of heaven I, with the deceased being embalmed and prepared for his journey across the sky into the afterlife, et cetera. So again, knowing what these are helps you interpret what the text is supposed to be showing you. They come from the palace facade and they're kind of the pillars that hold up the palace. So they become the pillars of heaven in the later text. This God's house thing. The outer edges of it often have these fun wavy lines. Now these wavy lines represent water. Again, part of the mud brick. 
The one other element in the mud brick is that when you're making the mud brick, you will often intentionally make these wavy patterns in the outer wall to represent water. And again, that comes from the creation myth. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> this is a, an altar at a sun temple. Uh, it's in a special shape. So this is, again, one of the ways that the language helps you interpret. If you have language made out of picture, you can actually um, use, make, use your language to embed in the shape of objects you're creating their meaning. This hetep, it means peace, um, also uh, offering. And so here we have an altar for offering um, surrounded by four hetep glyphs. The hetep is, I believe it's a roll, a scroll, rolled up scroll with a tie on it and possibly a, a bread loaf offering sat on top of the scroll. This is an offering table from Tutmosis III. So this is from a sun temple. So this is early, I think, third dynasty, fourth dynasty, something like that. Maybe it's a little later than that. It might be six. I can't remember when the sun temples were. Um, this is late stuff, new kingdom. And so you'll notice just continuity. This is, this is again, the hieroglyph, and this is an offering table. This is a false door, and in front of it is the hetep glyph, because this is where you're supposed to bring offerings for the deceased to set in front of his false door. So again, the, the hieroglyphs help you inform, help inform you of the meaning of the, of the shrines. Now, talking about offerings. If the temple is God's house, and this is the end of this concept of God's house, what does that mean, and what is it for? Well, I didn't get this for a long time. It just made no sense. And... Uh, blame this on Heidi. One day I was watching Pride and Prejudice. Uh, you know, the six um, volume hour BBC monster that just goes and goes and goes. Surprised at this point. Anyway, there's this, there's this scene where um, Mr. Darcy is so excited because he's thinking maybe Elizabeth likes him again, right? And he's got his hopes back up and he's, he's asking his, um, his, um, house servant to help him get his vest on. And, and, and so he's in the bathtub, right? So you get this scene of Colin Firth in the bathtub. So I guess the ladies like this or something. And anyway, and his, his servant is bringing hot water that's been heated down below and pouring it into the tub and over his head and bathing him. He's being bathed by his house servant. And then he stands up and his house servant, you know, hands him his towel and he dries himself off. And then his servant's helping him put on a, you know, a, 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 a vest, do you remember? And he's helping dress him. And I guess the ladies needed it even more, you know, those big bulky dresses they couldn't get into on their own. And, you know, that's just so bizarre. I, I take care of myself, you know, I can wash myself, I can shower. Um, but I guess if you're carrying, you know, big buckets of heavy hot water, it actually helps to have some, some servants around. Well, rich people, especially back then, were rich because they had manpower. We are rich because we have machines and washing machines and, and we take care of ourselves. But they were rich because they had manpower. And so, you know, if we want a nice meal, we can go to McDonald's. And, uh, and the fact that there's enough of us going to McDonald's means that they can be employed full time making hamburgers and it's cheap. I can afford a hamburger from McDonald's at will. If a king wanted a hamburger at will, somebody on call to cook just for him. Specialization and trade has allowed us all to be rich. But back then, it was about servants. So kings had servants. If God is a rich person, a more a king, then he has to have servants. And so the temple rituals, what they did in the temple is based on, among other things, what real servants did for the king or for their master, for their rich master. In other words, washing, clothing. In other words, the stuff the servant's doing for Mr. Darcy. Washing, clothing, anointing, and cooking and feeding their masters. The, again, if you remember the myth of the cow from the mythology class, Gods originally lived on the earth, but mankind rebelled. And so the gods killed a bunch of us. Remember when the cow slaughtered us? And then, then Ra felt bad and, and saved some of us by getting the cow drunk. And then Ra ascended up to heaven and left us alone to fend for ourselves. 
and kind of realized, hey, it was better off when we were serving the gods. That was better than having to fend for ourselves. This stinks. Please come back. And Ra didn't come back. So they started making statues of the gods. And what this, what this is trying to signify is we're sorry we, we rebelled. Please come back. We, and specifically the rebellion was to stop. They didn't want to be slaves, you know, washing, clothing, anointing, and feeding. So now here they are washing, clothing, anointing, and feeding the statue as an act almost of contrition for the rebellion. This is the Egyptian myth of the fall. Um, and it should see, you should see, I hope, parallels between both the Israelite temple tradition and the Israelite story of the fall. Now again, the Israelites don't have the statue, but the rituals they perform in the temple, in their temple, are almost identical to the ones that the Israelites, that the Egyptians performed. And they're spelled out in the book of Leviticus, those, those boring chapters that everyone gets, you know, you, you try to read them and it's the most boring part and your head starts to smoke until you spend a while in Egypt and then you go read them and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool because they're, they're washing, clothing, anointing, feeding who? Each other. It's in there. Those are the rituals you perform in the Israelite temple. You, you anoint a priest and it's got the list of how you do it and you're wa busy washing, clothing, anointing, feeding. The priests do it to each other because they're the image of God and that's how you do what the Egyptians were doing. I mean, you do it not to the statue, but to each other. Okay. So what we have here is this is the hieroglyph for Ka. Remember that, that, uh, that, that part of the soul that was like your double? But it also has this meaning of offering. And so sitting upon it are a bunch of bread loaves. And here's a person presenting the offering to the deity on the bread loaf. I apologize. I love to use these papyri that are from Joseph Smith's collection because that's just <laughs> it's just one of my things. Or that's what this is from. Um, this one, however, is on the on an Egyptian temple wall. Here we have over. You see this sled and an Egyptian version thereof. And here's an offering table. This offering table looks an awful lot like the table of offerings and the you know, the, ta the the table of showbread in the Israelite temple. And of course, sitting on top of it, just like you'd expect for the table of showbread, is a bunch of loaves of bread. But he's also got chicken, corn, pork, and I don't know what, I don't know this isn't corn, can't be corn, I don't know what this is. Lotus blossoms up here. And these are fowl. And then over here is a bunch of you know, chickens and who knows what all. Can't be corn though, because we hadn't got to America yet. That's what this looks like up here, right? It almost looks like corn, but I don't know what it really is. Can't be corn. In any event, he's making these offerings and he's holding here you know, this, this uh, object here, and then here is um, the incense altar. Here is a blow pipe you can blow in here to, to put air through the tip. And at the t up here in the cup, you put the, um, the coal, you blow through the pipe to get the air going on it, and you, you sprinkle the incense over the top of it. <coughs> so he's making an offering to the gods that he's purifying with incense, and this is the offering. So this is part of the whole taking care of the God bit. Right? You got to feed him. It's part of the ritual. Okay, so that's God's house. It's a house where God lives, but it's a king house. And he's got servants and the priests are the servants. And so the rituals you perform as a priest are the things that a master would, a servant would do for his master. The other thing the temple's supposed to do is memorialize the beginning of the world. So this, this is another layer layered on top of it because the temple is going to memorialize the beginning of the world built into stone so that the world can be rejuvenated and remade. So by feeding and taking care of the God, you rejuvenate the world and recreate the creation. So the temple has to represent the creation. So temple inscriptions express the belief that each temple was the continuation and reflection of the earliest mythical temple, which came into existence at the beginning of the world as the god's seat on the first occasion. You remember that was when the falcon put the little standard in the ground? In the creation, chaos reigned. The waters covered the earth. From the primeval waters, there emerged a low mud island. In the flotsam and jetsam of the edge of the waters, a piece of reed that drifted ashore was up by some demigods, stuck in the ground near the water's edge. Out of the surrounding gloom came a falcon, settled on the reed, and sanctified the island. I'm pretty sure I read this exact text to you when we did the mythology section. Again, there's some repetition between these different sections, but it's because this concept was important when we were talking about mythology. It's important again when we talk about temples, because 
that needed protection, so a simple reed wall seems to have been built around the island. The waters receded, the island grew bigger, it was possible to add rooms to either side of the first chamber, so that ultimately a complete temple of reed came to be built. In other words, the moment of creation was the moment of the creation of a temple, since then is recreating that original temple, which was made out of reeds, which is one of the reasons we're carving these things out of reeds and stone. Um, and then we come back to this picture, which you've already seen. But now this picture is interpreted, this actually is sitting on a mound, it's slightly higher. Here it's bulged. So here's the Mount of Creation. There's our uh, place where the falcon lit. There's our flags marking the spot. This is the island of creation. Yeah. A couple of the pylons had four. A couple had more. So I, it just might be a nice, neat number um, because I think they seem to have varying numbers from, from place to place. This one had four, and it's the earliest one, so that may have become a tradition, but I know that some of them had more. Um, so this is at Medina, uh, Medamed, um, and you've got these kind of um, earthen mounds. Again, they're trying to recreate the mound of creation. They actually took a bunch of sand and made a big mound out of it, and the mound was the, was the temple, and then they built these little shrines on top of the mounds. Um, later, they built a temple on top of that, built right on top, but they kept the idea, and so the Holy of Holies uh, sits right back here. And there's the courtyard as you come in. And again, it's sitting right on top of the mound of creation. So each temple um, would actually claim that they were the ones who were the original mound of creation. We were, we were the real one. We were the, and everyone would claim. And in fact, if you go to Israel today, the um, Temple of Solomon, you know, that foundation stone, a bunch of the kind of apocryphal Jewish writings will claim that that was the, the place where God stood when he created the world. Comes straight out of this same idea. Um, here's another one. There's a sand mound, and then they built this temple on top. And there's the Holy of Holies of the Temple Shrine sitting right there on the top of the, the mound from the earlier temple. The sanctuary itself in such temples is always higher than the rooms and halls in front of it, and the floor level drops again behind it. Perhaps the basic reason for both the pedestal type of construction and the changing floor level was a deliberate attempt to reproduce architecturally the original island of creation. And here's a picture of that. You see the steps? The floor is going up to the Holy of Holies, and then it actually drops away behind it. And the ceiling comes down. One of the things that's interesting about that is, and in fact, out here, you start in the sky. There's usually a courtyard out here that's, sur that's, that's surrounded, and maybe another pylon off in this edge. I want you to think of what that's like to go inside. I mean, for some, I, I think often of sacred spaces as big open things. Right here where we have our meetings. Right? We intentionally put lots of windows. It's big, it's open, it's airy, and that grants it a feeling of, of, of the sacred. In Egypt, you start in a courtyard, in a big open and airy place, and you work your way back in increasingly claustrophobic and narrow spaces. And that grants the feeling of almost oppressive sacredness. You feel the walls coming in. You can feel yourself coming up to the moment of creation. You can feel the walls coming down. And you're finding your way back to the womb, the dark womb. In fact, darkness is the other big deal. It's light out in the courtyard. The middle room has a hypostyle hall, which will often allow air, wind, light in through the windows. And then as you go back further, it gets darker and darker and darker until you find yourself in that moment of the Big Bang, is what we would call it, where in the beginning there was darkness upon the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light, and poof, there was light, right? So you're waking your way back to that moment of darkness at the back. <clears throat> and again, this is, this is reversing the creation almost, right? You're going back to the moment of creation. So as you work your way back, you go through these rooms. This is what I mean by this is a hypostyle hall. And that's just, you have these lower pillars. You have taller pillars in the middle, which allows a row of windows on the sides to allow light in. So the first room is a courtyard. Then you move into a hypostyle hall um, made out with reeds and, and to look like a journey through the sacred marsh, which is that early creation um, place where, you know, the marsh surrounded the island. 
Um, so you start with the waters, and then you work your way into the courtyard, into the marsh, and then back to the Holy of Holies. And those court, those pillars are then drawn out of these reeds. And we've, we've shown you this picture before, but now we're going to talk about it differently. Before, we were talking about how they were imitating the early shrines. And that's probably where it came from. They were imitating the early shrines which were made out of reeds because that's what they made things out of because they couldn't make it out of anything else. So they carved what they used to make in stone. But now they've attached to that a theological implication. These are the reeds of the original temple on the island of creation. Out of the reeds that were in the flotsam and jetsam as the water uh, settled out and the marsh land appeared. So now we've got a theological implication layered over the top of, a, of an architectural tradition that is older. The pedestal or rising floor level in the temple is an attempt to reproduce in stone this original site of the creation of the first temple. The concave and convex sections of the enclosure wall of the temple are decorated with wavy lines. These probably represent the waters of the original mythical ocean. Rosalie is more careful than I would. I don't know what else those represent. I mean, they're drawn like waves. Um, anyway, um, which had encircled the island of creation. That's the first shrine symbolized creation. So I showed you a picture of this. Remember the mud brick? So they would often make this stuff inside here out of stone, but these enclosure walls were bigger, harder to make, and they made them out of mud brick, and they had these nice wavy... They're doing that on purpose. It's not that they're bad at making walls, and... This is the island of creation, and this is the waters that surrounded it. Drawn in the wavy, and here's an actual picture of one of them. Wavy, mud brick, um, enclosure walls. This is clearly intentional, and it's intentional enough that they did it more than once. And they did it over and over again in lots of different versions and forms. And then in the back will be this stone temple. Yeah. So what what is it? So it's common is that if you make a dobe in a way it may have integrity. Um, uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, but it, just as we, that was probably done because they were imitating what they were making before. Logical. So there could be easily, they would often double up. They'll find a way to make things that just happen to work better architecturally but they'll have a theological implication attached to it. They never just do something for architectural, find a way to everything they did. So what we've got, let's, yeah, go ahead. Evan. That would explain the crenellations very well, right? When they made the mud brick crenellations, that's a wavy pattern, pattern in Y, vertically. Uh, and, and I think that has less, uh, less of the same effect. But, um, but I think they have some in X going on, too. If we can come back to this, let me get my thing. Let me go back. It's certainly going up and down, right? Up and down. I'm not, I'm not sure. That wouldn't surprise me in the least, because if you wanted to, if you, once you have that theological idea, you might as well make it wave in both directions, especially if there's an architectural advantage to waves in X holding the wall up and preventing it from falling. This is not a small structure. I mean, but you can see a person here. It gives you some sense of size, although he's much closer to the camera. <clears throat> okay, so there were three concepts of the temple. It's God's house. 
there, et cetera, et cetera. It's a representation of creation. And the third bit is it's a journey back to God. And this trip to heaven bit, um, I hope, will look familiar to you because we did this same lecture almost identically when we talked about the Book of the Dead. The Dead was about this guy who dies, so he wakes up a ferryman and he sails to the sky as a net and gets and go. Remember all that? What is it like to be a priest? To go through the rituals where you start in the courtyard, you work your way to the back, and come face to face, and then you take care of him, you wash him and clothe him, feed him, put him back on his throne, and then come back out. Like, and what theological implications did they ascribe to? Temples and sacred space in general journey. Example um, at it's um, and the worshiper goes around the pyramid and then goes up a level and it goes around the pyramid again and then goes up a level, approaching God circular in a circular fashion, coming closer and closer. To God, ambulation. There's the axial plan where you go on a journey to reach God. When mythology is written telling these stories, these are the quests, right? Go out and solve a quest and come back with the golden fleece or whatever. And, and in so doing, you, you find yourself or you find the divine in yourself or you find God. In the Buddhist version, there are depictions of the life of Buddha all the way around the temple. So as you circumambulate, you come to understand you find yourself as you reach the sacred these temples to um, emphasize the sacred center if there's a center of everything you're trying to find the center of the universe you go around because there's a center you can never quite reach and that's nirvana nirvana and enlightenment that's the buddhist version but if you're an egyptian there's a deity and you're going to start out here away from the deity, and you're going to work your way in there to the deity. So the goal is to find your way to God. All these exist. I can show you temples that, where these are the sorts of things you do axially, and then you circumambulate it in these sorts of the world. But in Egypt, we're mostly interested in the axial version. It's all about the journey. And therefore, it's all about initiation. Here, the journey begins before you even get to the temple, lying with all these sphinxes, down these, this row, row of sphinx, until you reach the pylon. The pylon is drawn in the shape. This is the Egyptian hieroglyph for the horizon. So the pylon itself is the beginning of guarded space because there we have the pharaoh smiting his enemies and guarding the entrance, and you have the deities guarding the entrance. But, but the shape itself, so you're entering the realm of guarded space, the realm of passing the horizon on a journey through the sky. So the rest of this journey is going to be a journey through the sky back to the moment of creation. Again, here's another version. This is, this is again, the horizon. So we've seen these pictures before, but before we were talking about the flags, now we're talking about the shape of the pylon, the fact that it's the horizon, and the whole point of talking about that is to realize that in the Book of the Dead, what the guy does is, remember, he passes the horizon. Well, now... We realize that if you're a priest walking up to the temple, you would recognize in your own writing system the sign that you're about to pass the horizon or a symbol of the horizon into the, into the heavens. This is a gateway to the heavens. Okay, so once you pass the horizons, there's a lot of things you can do. Some of these temples even would have bent plans where you would go at 90 degrees. But even so, 
what you end up doing invariably is you pass a series of rooms. A series of rooms. You make it to the rooms in the back. The rooms in the back are where the statue of the deity is. So it's about progression through a series of rooms to the place where God dwells. You can even get really fancy versions. This is my favorite one. It's from a late, uh, very late temple, but it's got two axes. This way to reach Isis, and this way to reach another deity. So you could worship two gods here, and you could do two different rituals in the same building, just depending on which way you approach a different god's uh, sanctuary. And that one's always clever. So one mystical interpretation of the temple is that it represented a microcosm of the sky. Well, that's what our horizon just told us, right? Um, with all the rooms to the left of the building sacred to the god in his role in the eastern part of the sky, while all the rooms on the right were concerned with his role in the western regions of the heavens. As the sky, the temple kept out the enemies, hid his mysteries. Um, the temple was also perhaps regarded as a mountain in which the god, or as a coffin in which the sun daily slept, God was reborn. Now let, let, let's, um, in, in Egypt, in Israel, the temple faced east, right? Well, I know this isn't a class on e Israel, but I want to show you how, once you see this concept, you recognize how it functions elsewhere. Um, if the temple faces east, then the right side is north, west, east. I find facing into the temple. There's a table of showbread and offerings to the God. There's an incense lamp that, that gives light to the thing. What well, just so happens that the offerings in Egyptian cosmology is to the north. So where do you think I put the table of showbread? It's on the right side to the north. Okay, the, the incense altar is going to be right in front of you because it's going to sit in front of you in the veil because one of the symbols of the veil in, in Israel is the, the pillar of smoke that Moses saw on top of Mount Sinai. So you burn the incense and it recreates the pillar of smoke that God appears in. So the incense altar is going to sit there. But on this side, that's the left side, which is going to be to which side of you? South. Now, if you're in the northern hemisphere, where is the sun? The ecliptic, where the sun was going to make its journey is to the south. The south is the source of light because the sun rises and the east sets in the west to the south. So to the south, on the side of where the sun sits, is the source of light, and that's where you put the lamp. Okay. So if the temple represents the heaven, then you've got to travel through the heaven. This is the sun um, sailing. This is raw, you know, in a solar bark, sailing through the doors of night into the sky, and then it dies and, and is born and is resurrected. We've gone through all that stuff in the, in the other lessons on, on funerary beliefs. But if I am in a temple, I cross the boundary here of the waters. I am that boat sailing with the sun. And we'll get to how, right? The first ritual you perform is to light a torch, a lamp that you then carry back with you into the darkness. You have to because you can't see. It gets dark back there, right? But, but this is the journey of the sun. You're taking the sun with you across the waters, past the horizon, and into its tomb where it will then come back out and be reborn again the next day. And by so doing, you rejuvenate the land itself and bring new life to the land by doing this ritual every day. And so then you cross the inner shrine, which again has these pillars. We've seen this now three times. First time, it was an architectural design imitating what they used to make them out of. Second time, it was, this is the flotsam and jetsam of the original creation. And now it is, this is we're traveling across the sky and the sky itself is a garden. So if you look at their depictions of the afterlife, it's water, but it's got these pillars of reeds and plants and, and marshes and, and farmland and places where you can plant crops and weed and all growing in kind of a garden. So this is now the garden of heaven. So you see their pictures of heaven. This is what it looks like. So now we can take this thing, and it can mean at least three different things, depending on what you're doing at the time. <clears throat> this is the text. 
this was our um, project. We spent we spent two semesters trying to translate this thing for our second second uh, year Egyptian uh, class. So this is what we tried our best to read, and I can't read it anymore. So I'm not going to really try um, to read the hieroglyphs. So I'll just pull out my translation. But um, this is the beginning of it. Says um, the beginning of the words of our of our divine things. So this is the beginning of the book where we keep our sacred stuff which are done in the house of Amon-Ra Sonter, Amon-Ra, king of the gods, in each and every day by a high priest, by the one who is on duty that day, being scheduled. You have to understand something about the high priest. Only high priest in all of Egypt. He's the king and the priest. He represents the deity, and he is the intermediary between us and God. But they had obviously too many temples for him to do everything. So the high priest is the Pharaoh's representative who would do the ritual for him and in his name. Because only the Pharaoh could do this ritual and make it, have it work, but, but the high priest could represent the Pharaoh and take his place. This is the temple this ritual is from Karnak. It's the largest temple. It's to Amun-Ra, king of the gods, Sonter, in Karnak. If you go one place to Egypt and visit one thing, it's going to be the pyramids. If you visit a second thing, it should be this. Uh, but this is a massive temple, um, probably the largest and the most interesting. So here's a ritual that happened every day. And people tend to think, you know, the things that happen rarely are the most important. And maybe they are because, you know, rarity creates sacredness. But the things you do every day matter to, matter the, to some extent the most. So this is the ritual done every day in the largest temple in all of Egypt. And it starts out here in the courtyard. So if you're here... You're out in the sun. You've got light. So let's imagine the journey. Here's that courtyard. I've passed my way down the pillar of, of all the sphinxes. I've passed the outer pylon, which is this massive, and I'm in protected space. So now sitting in front of the pylon in, in this courtyard, open to the sky where it's light, bright, and I can see, I'm going to do three rituals. I'm going to light a torch. I'm going to bear the censer. I'm going to put incense on the censer and place incense upon the fire of the censer. So there's, there's four rituals performed in the courtyard before I work my way in, and those are the four. Now, the, the, the recitation for lighting the torch, I have Horus. The eye of Horus was sometimes associated with the sun and the moon, but it was also the thing that was, you know, um, damaged by Seth, and then they had to bring it back to the gods, so it was repaired and then brought back. So the Eye of Horus became a symbol of the offering given to the gods. But in this journey, it's also a symbol of the, the, the sun and the moon passing into the darkness and then back out. So he's going to carry this light with him into the darkness and back out. And that light will be the sun, the Eye of Horus, and an offering for the gods. So he's going to bring with him a, a real offering. And the Eye is going to represent all those things at once. Again, the Egyptians are really good at this multiple meaning thing that they have going at the same time. So I guess I could read some of these, but we're running out of time. Um, so the only important real bit here is that porch is associated with the eye of Horus and the journey of the sun through the sky. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the points is that we've gone through this stuff before in the funerary texts. We talked about how the deceased journeys to the heavens. One of the spells, and we didn't do this spell, but one of the spells you can use to journey to the heavens is to light a censer to burn incense and to carry a torch. So you can see, have light in your journey through the, through the land of the dead. And here, written happily on the tomb of Peshetti, for us is said spell. And if you read said spell and you compare it to said ritual, they're similar. They're not the same, but they're similar. So again, these concepts of the deceased journey to the afterlife and the priest's journey through the temple are the same or connected. And of course, these pots of, these are fire pots, kind of lamps you can carry burning things. You can also burn incense on them, I believe. Um, there shall be made a heaven with stars, purified with natron and incense. Um, I wanted to, to leave this quote because, what is the burning of incense? Because that's one of the rituals, right? You, you light the torch to carry and you burn incense. Incense, if you, if you live in ancient Egypt, you stink. Because you don't get to take a shower every day and things smell. 
and you're slaughtering a bunch of animals for sacrifice and that smells, and incense smells nice. And so incense is a purification. It has a symbol of, of making yourself clean. It's a cleansing ritual to make yourself worthy because you don't want to enter the realm of the gods and stink. So you, you, and you, you see this still today in um, new age pagan sorts of things where they'll take a smudge wand and they'll purify the space and, and kind of purify the energy. Well, that's what they're doing with the incense. They're purifying the person to make him worthy of entering the place of the gods. So he brings light with him and he purifies himself to make himself worthy and clean so he won't be rejected and so he doesn't stink so bad. Now he's going to work his way through these halls filled with pillars. Can you imagine? I want you to imagine walking back through these pillars that are, you know, it takes like six people to wrap around one of their massive things and imagine what it would have looked like. And here's your spells. The recitation for traversing to the holy place and another recitation for traversing. And in this recitation, he awakens the temple and the gods. This one is really important because it looks and sounds an awful lot like the opening of the mouth ritual. So I hate to force you to remember something from a month ago. But the opening of the mouth ritual is that bit. Remember when you touch the different parts of the, of the mummy to bring it back to life? Well, now he's going to bring the different parts of the statue back to life, of the temple back to life. He's going to bring the temple to life. And on the temple walls are, are uh, carvings of people doing these rituals. So if the ritual ever stopped, remember how in the deceased you had food offerings carved on the walls? Because if the actual offerings ever stopped, then presumably the deceased could draw sustenance from the, the images on the walls. Well, now the very rituals of the temple carved on the walls of the temple are brought to life. The temple is brought to life. <clears throat> Those pillars bundles of reeds are brought to life and it lives and it brings life to the world because it lives. Um, so let's see, um, this one is worth, this one is worth reading. Let me find it quickly. So that's chapter two, chapter four. I want six, five, and six. Awake beautifully and in peace, O temple of Karnak. I read this to you last time, but remember it was awake, beautiful ferryman, and bring me to the next life. I mean, I, I should have brought that too and read it again for you, but I told you it was hard to figure out what order to do this in because the ferryman is interesting because the temple ritual is interesting, but the temple ritual is interesting because of the ferryman. All right. Awake beautifully and in peace, O temple of Karnak, mistress of the temple, and the gods and goddesses who are in it, gods and goddesses who are in Karnak, the gods and goddesses which are in Thebes, the gods and goddesses which are in Heliopolis, the gods and goddesses who are in Memphis. He's, he's waking up the whole world, right? Um, the gods and goddesses which are in heaven, the gods and goddesses which are in the earth, the gods and goddesses which are in the south, the north, the west, and the east, the kings of lower Egypt, and the children of the kings who received the white crown, and who make the move, uh, movement for Atum in Karnak, uh, Amun in Karmak. As you wake, so may you rest. Flee and in peace. So this is this is so. Imagine walking through the pillars, and then and, and as you go reciting this ritual, um, similar to the the the, um, the opening of the mouth and the waking of the ferryman. This is what it looks like still there and you walk your way back beautifully painted although everywhere the sun touched it the painting has faded but imagine what it would have looked like painted um, these open spots would have been closed originally there was a roof and the roof has fallen in um, but these pillars held up these stone slabs and on top of the stone slabs was a roof this was the source of light these windows here on the side so you went from an open courtyard where you could see back into this mysterious thing where you see these pictures of the gods carved on the statues in bright colors, but you can barely see them because it's dim light, half from the light of the windows, half from the light of your torch as you walked your way back and burned your incense and said these words about waking up. And you can imagine almost the pillars coming alive in front of you and, and this thing out of stone 
not being stone anymore. Now remember, the symbol of the thing is the thing. And if it's made out of stone, it's the symbol of the thing carved in stone, but he's turning the symbol into the thing with his words. Okay. So again, this is, this is part where you can see where how it would have been you know, covered over and you wouldn't have been able to see. And up here is where you can see the color. Um, and unfortunately, my camera didn't do a great job. But up there, because the sun isn't shining, it doesn't bake it off, so there's still some of the paint that gives you some of the idea of how colorful it would have been. Another good way to get an idea of the color would be the book that's being passed around from the Valley of the Kings. It would have looked like that everywhere. Uh, so now you've passed here. As you come out here, I, I almost had pictures of this. There's these two small, uh, tall pylons. There's a whole story we could tell about how to erect a pylon. It's really hard. We don't know how to do it. It's, these things weigh thousands of tons, and they're one big block of stone. And who knows how they did this. Um, but anyway, there's these two big tall, um, tall obelisks, I apologize, and then pylons again. And then you work your way back. And here is the Holy of Holies right there. And there are two rooms to the Holy of Holies. One possibility for the two rooms is, again, uh, some sort of a hidden and a uh, I'm not sure why there were two. But there's two rooms to the Holy of Holies. This is the whole equivalent to the Israelite holy place, which in the Israelite temple represents the Garden of Eden. And here it's these large marshy swamp things as you work your way back to creation. And this is the womb of the world. And that's where the God is. So you've worked your way back. It, here, there's no light. So you get into here, it's dark. Here, you've got the windows. Here, it just gets dark. Perfect. And the walls are coming in, and the ceiling's coming down, and you're going up the hills. And now we get to the Holy of Holies, and this is what the Holy of Holies looked like. If you were to walk around these um, sh uh, telltale shapes here, though, that's part of the shrine. Images I showed you before would have these curved um, tops of the shrine. And carved on the side is a washing, clothing, and anointing ritual for the Pharaoh, where the Pharaoh, you know, I told you about the shape of the throne with the carved thing on the, the little square on the side. Well, there it is on the throne. This is the, the Pharaoh eventually um, being presented before Amon Ra Sonter, sitting on his throne as the Pharaoh is made Pharaoh. And the God is giving. Below it is a picture of the ark that is actually probably inside this little structure. But the pre around to the side and look at these pictures, he probably went inside. Is chapter 7, the recitation for parting the veil. Ra and said, Yadit, the recitation for parting the veil. Recite, part the veil, open the sea. Him, having brought you the eye of Horus. He's carrying that torch with him, right? Remember the eye is also the, the idea of an offering. Um, your eye to you, O Horus. So Seth is taken and put it back. Of course, this isn't even Horus, isn't the god he's sent to you. So here, but his point is he's bringing him what he's lost. And he's here to help. The word yadit is the same word used in the Book of the Dead for the veil, for, for, the, for the net. So this is the veil of the temple. Here's, these, here's the yadit in the Book of the Dead. A couple different pictures of it. The idea is if I'm sailing across the sky, trying to go to heaven, uh, the gods are up there fishing, and I can get caught in the net, and then I'll never, it's one of the dangers. I have the secret words to get through that will be trapped. Well, here the priest is passing of the temple, which is connected to the net of the Book of the Dead. So, uh, now at this point, it's nice because three of the chapters from this text, this is all text, right? It's just that papyrus I showed you. Three of the chapters are carved on walls. So we get to see a picture of what, what it might have looked like. This, starting at this chapter. Recitation for breaking the seal. And this is what he means by the seal. This is the seal from Tutankhamun's tomb. You take a rope and you wrap it around. The, the bolts and some clothes. So it's, it's like sealing a document, how we would do it with a ring. 
um, and it goes all the way back to Egypt doing that with you know, how we would seal a um, document. Uh, this one is unbroken. He had to break it to get into Tutankhamun's tomb. And before he went into the tomb, he took a picture of the unbroken seal. So the first spell is to part the veil, break the seal, draw back the bolt, open the doors of heaven, and come face to face with God. And so here's an idea of what, you know, what we mean by the bolt, the doors of heaven. This is a small shrine for a deity. It's gilded wood, but this is not the Holy Holies at Karnak, but that's the idea. The, the Holy Holies at Karnak is made out of stone, but the doors are gone. But they would have had these wooden doors covered by a veil. And now he's, there's the bolt. He's got to pull back the bolt, break the seal, and now he can pull open the doors. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And he's going to seal it on the way out and open it on the way in. So we're still, well, the question was, are we still in the daily ritual? And the answer is yes, we're still in the daily ritual. And then in the back here is this pedestal where the God would have sat and the gods are, we don't have any real idols from Egypt. They were made out of gold and precious materials and they've all been looted. Um, but here's the stand where the idol would have been. So it's really hard to guess what the idol would have looked like. But if we're going to guess, well, this is, this, is, this is inside. So once you go inside the Holy of Holies, this is what it looks like. Again, beautifully painted. It's been, it's been um, vandalized, but for the most part, beautifully painted. Um, and this is actually a picture of the king being, being um, poured, with water being poured on, their, on his head, her head, actually. I think this is a uh, chipsuit. I'm not sure. Um, and this is probably what you would have seen. This one is not from Karnak. This is from Edfu, but... This is the, the ark sitting on this uh, post. Remember, the, this is the stand thing we saw from the old mud brick. And remember, those old mud brick things are 3000 BC, very old. And this is you know, 1000 BC. They're still doing this at Karnak. In fact, they still do this at Karnak when Jesus is walking the earth. So um, when we talk about continuity of tradition, this is unlike anything we've ever seen, 3,000 years worth of tradition. Um, and this is again our Ark of the Covenant. So now once you get inside, um, the rest of the ritual is you fall on your face. And if you've seen the, um, the Muslim prayer, you know, we pro, pro, um, prostration, they prostrate, stand up, prostrate, stand up. The recitation says, among other things, I have not come to take the God from his throne, but to place him upon his throne. I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to rob the temple, just like I'm not here to rob the, the, um, the tombs of the pharaohs. I'm here to make sure you're exalted forever and to give you your offering. And then he takes him out. He washes clothes, feeds, anoints, does his makeup, puts the statue back. But imagine the darkness again. He's carrying a little torch. It's pitch black. And he comes face to face with something that looked about like that. We, we don't have any of these, but if we have to guess, remember the whole point of mummification and putting this golden mask on Tutankhamun was to turn him into an idol, to turn his mummy into an idol. This is the sort of workmanship we would have been talking about, which would have been awe-inspiring. And again, the priest knows it's a statue, but they believe that they can infer life into things that look like, that, that symbolize the, real, the reality. So he's coming face to face with the symbol of the reality that he's endowed with the power of the reality. And then he's showing his willingness to serve God by serving this image of God. And again, I think this would have been an incredible experience, a spiritual experience for someone doing this. Yeah. No. So, um, Again, this is part of the hidden sacred. This, this ritual was seen as endowing the entire land with life. So the normal people knew about this ritual, knew it was being performed, and supported it, the priests in doing it, paid them, helped them with the money. Um, but then the priest was doing it for the people. Actually, the priest was doing it for the pharaoh, who was the representative of the people. And so the pharaoh and the priest for the pharaoh was offering these offerings to the God on behalf of the people, on behalf of all the people. But the people didn't get to do this. This was the sacred thing. 
not, I wouldn't say any ritual. So there, there were things the people did. The people went to the courtyard. The people could pray to the God. The people could ask for, there were rituals they could perform for, to ask for healing. <clears throat> but this ritual was for the priests. And this is, again, part of the, the hidden, sacred, uh, revealed trade-off that they have to make. The hundreds, hundreds by this point. Yep, some are male, some are female. Amon Ross on Terra is male. <laughs> That's also true. Huh. Somehow my images stopped being shared. That's what we should have been putting on the videos. All right. Let's, um, let's see. We're, we're running out of time, so let's see how quickly I can go through this. Um, the god would have either been standing or seated upon a throne. If he was on a throne, this gives you an idea of what the throne would have looked like. This is, again, from Tutankhamun, which is our best guess for how the thing worked. The kind of culmination is to be embraced by God, to make your way back there and, and meet your God. Uh, and to, to, find, to, to find this connection with the God and to serve him and then to return with his power for the world. All right, so let's, we've done four classes worth of this stuff. Uh, let's try to summarize uh, what, everything we've done and let's see if I can do this quickly because we are definitely running a little late today. Egyptian religion posits that the world has a problem. Decay is fit, and posits a solution. And we need to return to order, mot, have a conservative government, conservative religion, and bring ourselves back to the way things were after the creation of the world. And each of those things were seen as a journey. The journey of the deceased, the journey of the priest, and these journeys are seen and worked as initiations. So we can think of Egyptian religion as an initiation. <clears throat> To make sense of that, though, I'm going to start with this idea of guild initiations, trade guilds. We know very little about them, but we know a few things. The first is that they're really old. The next is that until very recently, we had a lot of them. They only went away a few, you know, a few years ago. Um, and they weren't just mumbo-jumbo. They were practical organizations and institutions. They wanted to inflate demand for their product by making sure they were the only ones who could make it. And that meant they needed to keep the way of making their product secret. If you make a Stradivarius, you don't want to tell anyone else how to make a Stradivarius, but you want to make sure that the making of Stradivariuses doesn't disappear, yet you want to keep it secret. So you want to decrease the supply, inflate the demand, and the way you inflate the demand is to make a good product and you want people to won't come to you because you're a member of the guild, and that means you can make it better than anyone else. You want to make a good product, you want to decrease the supply, increase the demand, and keep the technique secret, but pass the techniques on. And that's actually, so there's some competing goals in there, right? And so to do that, you've got to have a teaching system. And, and then you've got to have some way of accrediting whether somebody is an, is an authentic member of your guild who's passed the test of being a worthy maker of the Stradivarius. The way you do that is with an apprentice system, right? You take apprentices, you teach them the basics. If they're trustworthy, you teach them more. And trustworthy also means capable of keep, keeping a secret. Secrecy becomes important in these rituals. And that's, again, part of the trade-off between the hidden and the revealed, it's the same trade-off we're seeing here, and it's also sacred because these guilds tended to conflate what they were doing with religion. So, I don't know what the ancient uh, guilds were like because they kept it secret, right? But I can tell you what modern guilds were like. They had a central myth. They had levels or degrees, apprentice, journeyman, master, they had signs of recognition that you could use to prove that you were a member of the Netmakers Guild. A secret handshake with a bunch of names, and they would convey the secrets, the signs of recognition, in the central myth that they would tell the people as part of an initiation ritual when they initiated you into the guild. 
And then they had examinations for the secret information to tell if you were a member. Because if you remember, you had seen the ritual. If you'd seen the ritual, you would know the secret handshakes. If you knew the secret handshakes, you were a member of the guild and you could prove that you were to other members of the guild who otherwise might be really unhappy if you started making Stradivariuses in their neighborhood. They might actually run you out and kill you. But if you can prove you're a member of the guild... So we don't do this anymore, and the only reason we don't do it anymore is because we have transcripts and phones. You call up the university, and you know, did so-and-so get a PhD from such-and-such, and, such? and the answer is yes, and you're done. If you can't do that, what you do instead is you pass around secret handshakes. And we think the secret handshakes are kind of silly. It's the secret little boys club, right? But what we don't understand <coughs> is that they served an incredibly practical purpose in the ancient world. Right up until the 1800s. An incredibly practical application. If you knew the secret handshake, you had a PhD. And the only way that worked is if we kept the secret handshake secret, dang it. And if you revealed the secret handshake, they probably would kill you. Because that undermines the entire credential system society is based on, so they were quite serious about it. And so often the rituals would talk about, you know, I, will, uh, I would rather die than reveal this, this secret handshake. It's because they were serious business, but all they were is a credential system to prove that you had a PhD. It's nothing quite as mysterious as, as we sometimes think, but it's just this simple concept. They still exist today in Freemasonry, which maintains this form of initiation to the T, but they also exist in, if you ever get initiated in a Phi cap of whatever, beta 20, you know, whatever, pick your, pick your fraternity, this is probably how they will initiate you, and there'll probably be some of the same stuff in it. But this is where it comes from, secret names, handshakes, hand gestures, mythical interpretations of the working tools of the trade. And then they have, at the end, oaths, where you promise to keep it secret, you promise to, if the Hippocratic Oath is actually the prime example, it's the Doctor's Trade Guild Initiation Oath. You promise to do a bunch of stuff, including never do an abortion and whatever else you list, and to never do harm, and there's this whole Hippocratic Oath that's worth reading, but it's an initiation oath for a trade guild. Okay. So here's an example, you know, I'm a Freemason, and here's the mythical working tools of his trade reinterpreted mythologically. So that's what modern guilds look like. We presume the old ones look the same. If the old ones look the same, then what we see in ancient Egypt is a bunch of trade guild stuff happening, and that's why Egypt, Egypt has all this secrecy. So we, we didn't talk a lot about it, but a lot of this stuff in the Book of the Dead is listed as secret, and yet we're busy reading it because we have copy, but these are secrets. Probably because they're involved in a priestly guild initiation. The priests had a guild where you could prove that you were a priest. Priesthood was hereditary, but you could prove you were a priest because you had studied under so-and-so. He had given you the secret information, and you could prove it. So here's a priest's initiation. Special clothing, including an apron and, and certain... Um, uh, um, white linen garments, a shaved head. Here's a man being initiated as a priest. He comes in here with his head with, full of hair. He comes through the, the uh, and I, we went through this. This is, again, part of that repetition. We've, you've seen this before. Hopefully it's in a slightly new context. Um, and it's in a summary. But, you know, here's, here's your secret name of this God, and I have not committed this sin. This is the oath. So I know the secret information, and I've kept the oath. I know this secret information, and I've kept this oath, and I know this secret information, where the secret information are secret names for the deities. And as he works his way past down the secret information from one end of the shrine to the other, he pops out the back with his head shaved and his wearing the priest clothes. So this is a priest's initiation. And, of course, now his heart is being weighed. What does that mean? This comes from the Book of the Dead. What that means is, there was a living priest's initiation. Almost, now, this is, this, is, this is speculative, but almost certainly the case. There was a living priest's initiation that is similar to the Book of the Dead 125. And the Egyptians saw their trip through the afterlife to meet God in terms of the initiation of the living priests. And so the secret bits of the Book of the Dead that make no sense to us the reason they don't make sense to us is because we weren't initiated. We're just looking at the modes of recognition for an initiation ritual that we didn't participate in. And so no wonder it's confusing. Uh, that the modes of recognition are, are the list of secret information that you need to have 
to prove that you're a member of, now it's the guild of the priests for the living, but now it's the guild of the gods for the dead. You're proving you're a god. You're proving you're a member of their fraternity. It's a fraternal initiation, fraternal initiation, and you're proving you're a member of the fraternity, and that's what passing through the heavens is all about, with secret names, covenants, and judgment, to see if you've kept the covenant that you made. And so this is from Jan Asman 30 years ago in a fine study on the Egyptian background of the magic flute, which is an opera by Mozart. Uh, Sigmund Morenz expressed the view that central aspects of Egyptian burial ceremonies lay in a sort of priestly initiation into the realm of the dead. So Asman is saying what I just said to you. And that's the way to interpret the Book of the Dead. So, stages of initiation for the dead. Mummification, awakening in the tomb, passing the horizon, ascending the sky, awakening the ferryman, passing the catching nets, opening the doors, passing the deities, justified in judgment, and entering the presence of Osiris. And that's the way back to heaven. So I'm trying to summarize. You've seen that before. Or, but gosh darn it, what does that sound like? That's the spells we just went through for the way through the temple. So the priest's journey through the temple is an initiation. It's the priest's, and there's also the priest's initiation to be a priest, which is represented in the Book of the Dead, the priest's passage through the temple, and the deceased's passage through the heavens are all the same thing, including waking the ferryman and being judged and all this. Now, there's one other initiation ritual that you haven't seen. But go read about it. It's interesting. And that's the Isis mystery initiations. And one of the reasons it, it's interesting is because it's what lasts the longest. This is the last bit of Egyptian religion kind of to be stamped out by Christianity. And this is a map of all the places we have temples to Isis. In the Greco-Roman period, initiations became a big deal usually um, secret mystery cults. One of the most famous is the Eleusinian Mysteries. You'll see them pop up throughout all of ancient writing. If you spend any time, you know, with the classics, you know, Greek classics, you'll bump into the Eleusinian Mystery Cults. The Isis Mystery Cults are probably more popular than the Eleusinian Mystery Cults. They're drawn from Egypt, merged with Greek concepts, and turned into an initiation ritual although they probably already were. This is, I think the initiation rituals actually come from Egypt, not Greece. I think Greece is borrowing from Egypt through the Isis mystery cults, and then the Eleusinian cults probably borrow from Egypt. And that's where the Eleusinian mysteries come from too. So there's a, here's a plan to the temple of Isis. There's a temple main altar building with a water tank, meeting hall, initiation chamber, priest lodging, statue of Venus, Isis. Um, and um, if you ever get a chance, go watch The Magic Flute. The Magic Flute is uh, Mozart's attempt to reconstruct the initiations of Isis uh, in, a, in, a, in an opera. And it's beautiful music. And he's probably wrong about, you know, but he's, he's, he is interpreting his stuff in terms of the Isis mystery traditions. And here's a text you can go read. Lucius Epilius is the golden ass. Think the emperor's new groove, by the way. That's uh, sort of the similar story. Um, and this text is um, in some way related to the Isis mystery text. Now, one of the things, if you know me, I like puzzles. Because this was secret. But I can guess... And the reason I can guess is because we just went through all these other initiation rituals from Egypt. And I know the myth of Isis and Osiris and her son Horus and their battle with Seth and the death of Osiris from a mythology class. And if I put all that together, I can guess what this initiation ritual is like. And it went all the way. Now, if we go back to the map, I mean, there's one of these things up in Scotland. Gosh, dang it. Right. And this, these temples are some of the last vestiges of paganism stamped out by Europe. And so this went on for a long time. And yet we know next to nothing about what they did. But people came from all around to be initiated into these rituals. And this, you asked if, if anyone could do the other ritual. No. But this 
lots of commoners were initiated into the Isis mysteries. And this is a late development, right? So this is a much later development than the other stuff we were studying, but this was something the commoners could do and they flocked to it in huge numbers and they kept it secret to the point where we don't even know what they did. So this is one of those great um, mysteries. But when I put it all up on a, on, a, on a platform, I can guess some of the things the mystery cults did because of, of um, the golden ass story, which it tells us some of those things. And there's also some exposés from the Christians trying to, to reveal what happened. But levels or degrees, signs of recognitions, examination, secrecy, washing, clothing, anointing, sensing, passing the horizon with a boat, net, doors, oaths, and seeing God. This is, this is the pattern. And it's almost certainly what's happening over here too. There's a lot of question marks there, right? But I think those probably are yeses. And that's what the ritual is about, which is what Mozart concludes in The Magic Flute. So if you go watch The Magic Flute, in about that order. So that is Egypt, and it's why I like it. This is, this is interesting to me, and it's all done through the concept of initiation in an effort to overcome chaos and establish order in our lives, in the world around us. When you order your life in an initiation, you create order out of chaos in your life. You see meaning and purpose in your life. You realize what you're here for and where you're here to go, and you order your life through this initiation ritual that you participate in that unfortunately we, we can't find anymore because it's gone. So, yeah. Absolutely. Because you've got to initiate the priest. You also, so the, sorry, I apologize to people. On, on the, the question was, um, isn't this also the, the uh, syllabus for teaching priests? Yes. Right? Um, the, the initiation rituals are something you earn by learning other stuff first, but they're also teaching tools in and of themselves. Right? So, so the ritual itself teach, is part of the teaching tool that makes you into who you're supposed to be. Um, but, but you also have to qualify for it by learning other things. So if I'm in guild initiation, I have to show proficiency in making nets. And then I do a ritual that actually teaches me something about making nets, but it also teaches me something more about being a good person who people want to buy nets from. Right? And then I can go back and learn some more about making nets and I can incorporate stuff from the ritual and I can incorporate meaning in my life and apply the meaning to, what, to my vocation. So I think if we were to apply this to the Unitarian principles, this is a way of ordering a life in order to see meaning in the task. <clears throat> and it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the techniques that these people produce in their search for meaning in life. Not their search for truth, but their search for meaning in the tasks they performed on a daily basis. And then they apply those to their journey to the afterlife to... to Etern their quest for eternal life and living forever and how they go to heaven and all that other stuff. Yeah. Just the common people participated in building the temples. I, don't, I think specialized tradesmen, you know, I mean, it took specialized skills to build the temple, but there was a whole working class of people who built these things. And we know that the, the amount of labor it took to build them was massive. We also know they had um, periods of the year when their fields were flooded. So we believe a lot of people had dual jobs. They were farmers you know, during, the, during the farming season, and they worked on temples during the, the rest of the time. And, the, and they were not slaves. They were probably paid and probably well paid you know, by standards of the day for the work they did out of taxes that came out of their own, you know, but... Okay, any other questions before we finish? Well, that's Egypt. And we're done with Egyptian mainline religion. We'll, we'll, do, a, we'll do a side note with uh, the Amarna heresy next time. But that's the end of 
traditional Egyptian religion. Thanks. Now let's see if I can quickly bring up a calendar because um, I want to try to figure out uh, when next class is going to be. If I can get a calendar to come up. Uh, and by the way, you're welcome to come up and look at the, I've got a stack of books here. There's there's treats in the fellowship hall, and there's a stack of books here you can look through while, while we eat, the, eat said treats. And let me see if I can get a calendar. Calendar.google.com. All right. Today is my day off. Where is the month? So I work on the 7th. The 22nd. So our next class will be on the 22nd of September. Um, yeah, that will probably be the 4th, right? Because September... So yes, next class will be the 4th instead of the 3rd. And I'll see you then.